Good morning. We welcome you to Calvary Episcopal Church in Columbia, Missouri. We're so glad you've joined us for worship on this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. This is a right to service of anti-communion, which means everything that happens before the sharing of communion at our regular Sunday service of Holy Eucharist. We have a full service bulletin for you on our website at www.calvaryonnineth.org, or you can follow along in the Book of Common Prayer beginning on page 355. Our hymns come from the 1982 hymnal, which we affectionately call the Blue Hymnal and other approved sources. Our opening hymn is number 615, Thy Kingdom Come on Bended Knee. We will sing verses one and four. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God is in you. And also in you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant that after having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure. That when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Joshua. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river 
and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the re region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us from our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went, and among all the peoples from whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7, and we will read it in unison. Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will declare the mysteries of ancient times, that which we have heard and known and what our forefathers have told us, we will not hide from their children. We will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of the Lord and the wonderful works he has done. He gave his decrees to Jacob and established a law for Israel, which he commanded them to teach their children that the generations to come might know, and the children yet unborn, that they in their turn might tell it to their children, so that they might put their trust in God, and not forget the deeds of God, but keep his commandments. A reading from St. Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica. We do not want you to be informed, uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself with a cry of command, 
with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, we will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gradual hymn for today is hymn 623. Oh, what their joy and their glory must be. We will sing verse 1. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took the flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. En el nombre de Dios, que es Trinidad en unidad. Amen. In our collect today, we affirmed that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Then we ask God to grant us the hope to purify ourselves as he is pure. I wish we could talk together so I could ask you what you make of this prayer. There are two terms in it that stood out for me as a priest and pastor, the devil and purity. My experience is that they are often misunderstood and certainly misapplied, so let's discuss them. The devil is a persona that has evolved over the centuries and the meaning today is radically different from the biblical understanding. Remember that Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Satan, however, is not a proper noun, but a descriptor, and it means tempter, distractor from the path of the will of God. By loving Jesus and wanting to protect him from the fate that awaited, Jesus became Satan to Jesus. The lesson is, we all can, even when we are acting out of love. To purify ourselves, then, we must return to the path of the will of God. That's it. That's what purity of heart is, biblically speaking. And this connects us to the gospel parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids. 
this is a hard parable to understand. As we know by now, parables are meant to wake us up, shake us up, and cast out our certainty like a rock thrown into a lake, leaving us standing there watching the ripples flow out into the still water, wondering what just happened. As I stood prayerfully on that proverbial lakeshore watching the ripples, I saw the church, the body of Christ in general, and Calvary in particular. Suddenly I understood that the wise bridesmaids are those who know their own divine purpose and the divine purpose of their vessel and how to use it, keeping them on the path of the will of God. In the parable, the bridesmaids have a purpose. They are to serve the bridegroom who is coming by lighting his path using their lamps. The wise ones knew what they would need to take with them because they understood their own purpose and the purpose of the lamp. The foolish ones brought their lamps, but no oil. You can almost see the meme for this. You had one job. The lamp is an empty, useless vessel without the stewardship of the bridesmaids. This is a powerful wake-up, shake-up kind of moment for those of us who are the church. Our church buildings are our lamps, the means by which we shine the light of Christ in the world. They have a purpose, but without our stewardship, they are useless vessels. Our stewardship, however, isn't as simple as weekly attendance, participation in ministry, or annual pledging, although those are all important. Our stewardship includes an understanding of our divine purpose as the body of Christ in this time and place, and how God is calling us to serve. Our beautiful building is the vessel of our community. It is at once the repository of the many resources God has given us and the vessel from which we serve in our corner of God's kingdom. It's our home base, but it is a useless vessel without our stewardship. Another lesson we've been blessed to learn during this pandemic is that our buildings offer us support, but are not the source of our identity or our worship. We have been set free from that certainty and our building can now reclaim its rightful spot as a tool, a vessel for the accomplishment of our service to God and God's people. The source of our identity is Jesus Christ, and he is not constrained by a pandemic or inhibited by an election. Therefore, neither are we. On Wednesday morning, the day after the election, as I was praying, I heard the wisdom of God speak to me. I was praying out of habit, and with a hope that I might not get caught up in the anger and contempt that is peddled in so much discourse right now. I was brought to remember a Jewish Midrash story I heard years ago in a religion class I took in undergrad at Rutgers about the parting of the Red Sea in the book of Exodus. According to the Midrash, when Moses and the Israelites got to the other side and watched the Red Sea crash in on the Egyptians, killing them, they rejoiced in their salvation at the hand of God. But God admonished them, saying, There is no reason to rejoice. Those now dead beneath the Red Sea waters are my children too. The church is not concerned with who sits at the resolute desk in the White House. We are concerned with the suffering of our neighbors, many of whom are truly and deeply suffering. Many were suffering before the election, and many will suffer as a result of it. How do we serve them, all of them? The church is concerned with noticing evil, that is, whatever divides us or causes pain, sadness, or undue burden, or whenever someone is excluded or disrespected. Wherever we discern evil, the church's mission is reconciliation. As Episcopalians, our identity is via media, the middle way, established by Elizabeth I in order to stop the killing of Protestants by Catholics and Catholics by Protestants during the Reformation era. We are all English, she said, and we must find a way to live together in peace. To accomplish that, Elizabeth commissioned a team of theologians, writers, and poets, led by Thomas Cranmer, 
to produce a book of worship that would spiritually feed the Catholics and Protestants among her people. Our Book of Common Prayer has its roots there and remains the symbol of our unity today. We do not seek uniformity of doctrine, but unity in prayer. Whatever differences our diversity raises up among us, we are made one body, one spirit, when we pray and worship together. As priest and theologian Henri Nouwen says, quote, Every time we encounter one another, we are offered an occasion to encounter the sacred, unquote. A bond of relationship builds over time, enabling us to discern the path of the will of God in our time and live it together in all our diversity, in the name of God and for the sake of God's people and creation. One simple but stunning illustration of that is our habit of praying the Lord's Prayer together, where we proclaim the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Whether we're talking about the pandemic, the election, the persistent destructive malignance of racism and the other isms that divide us, we count on God delivering us from what divides us. We repeat this prayer often to remind ourselves of God's redeeming love so that we aren't led into the temptation to despair or abandon hope while God acts to redeem, and God is always acting to redeem. We, as Calvary Church and individually as members of it, are the means by which the light of Christ shines in the world in downtown Columbia today. We, in all our diversity, frailty, and wisdom, have a purpose. To radiate with the light and the truth that we all are beloved children of a loving God. All of us. The church, our church, is a place where the truth of everyone's belovedness is intentionally and counterculturally lived out. When the world blames and excludes someone for being poor and hungry, we welcome them into our midst and feed them. When the world derides someone for whom they love, we celebrate that God is the author of all love. Our church's divine purpose is to shine the light of the truth of everyone's belovedness until everyone believes it and lives it and glorifies God for it. I close with a prayer from Bishop Stephen Charleston, retired Bishop of Alaska and member of the Choctaw Nation. Give your heart to love today, not to old thoughts of who you were, but to the new idea that your kindness could change another life. Give your mind to hope today, not to the usual list of impossibilities, but to a single faith that goodness is the purpose of history. Give your spirit to peace today, not to the anger of the moment, but to the welcoming road of grace that leads to the home for which you have longed. Give your hands to the work of justice today, not in resignation, but in certainty, knowing that what you do will make an enormous difference. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Rejoicing in the promise of new life in Christ, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. We pray for your holy Catholic church. Fill it with your truth and empower as people to joyfully share and live the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray for all ministers, especially Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church, Dion, Bishop of Missouri, Valerie, our interim rector, Janet, our deacon, Mo, our pastoral visitor, and Josh, or seminarian. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you and that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for the whole world that you may fill it with your peace. Help us to honor and care for your creation and to use its resources wisely for the good of all. We pray for those who govern and hold authority that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world, especially for Donald, our president, Mike, our governor, Brian, our mayor, Stephanie, our county health director, and Peter, Columbia Public School superintendent. May there be justice and peace on the earth. We pray for those who are in need for those who are hungry or homeless, for the sick and the injured, and for those who do not yet know God's love. We pray for those suffering from the two pandemics of coronavirus and racism. Have compassion on those on our parish prayer list and those we now name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. May all be delivered from their distress. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially for the beauty of the earth. We give you thanks and ask your blessing on all who are searching for treatments and vaccines to fight the coronavirus, and we pray for other blessings we now name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Almighty God, you proclaim your truth in every age by many voices. Direct in our time, we pray, those who speak where many listen and write what many read, that they may do their part in making the heart of this people wise, its mind sound, and its will righteous. To the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. 
that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of that peace safely. And now we will hear about announcements of what's going on at Calvary from our vestry person, Jennifer James. Thank you, Janet. It's my pleasure to share highlights of the important happenings at Calvary and how you can get involved. Our second parish summit entitled Consciously Present will be happening today, November 8th at 1030 a.m. Join your church family on Zoom to discern God's purpose for us and clarify our vision for living out that purpose. The sign-in information can be found on Calvary News email sent out by Connie on Wednesday and on our Calvary website. The 2021 annual stewardship letters and cards have been mailed, and if you've not yet received yours, you will shortly. A pledge card can also be found online, and we encourage you to prayerfully consider your pledge. The needs are greater than ever. Our pledges allow us to continue our many missions within the community, to minister to our own church family, and maintain our beautiful church home. If you have questions, please contact Bob Worley. Mark your calendars for the upcoming virtual St. Nicholas Advent Bazaar on December 5th. This is a great way to accomplish some of that holiday shopping. And as always, those proceeds are going to go to charitable organizations within our community. So keep an eye out for additional information about the bazaar closer to the time. Don't forget about our blessing box that sits on the 9th Street entrance to our church. We continue to rely on financial donations or donations of socks and non-perishable food items and water to meet the needs of our downtown neighbors that are in need. Speaking of that, despite the beautiful weather this week, it is time to talk about room at the inn. And it's going to be opening in December despite all of the many challenges associated with sheltering large numbers of people during a pandemic. Additional financial support is needed to make this happen and keep the guests and the volunteers safe. If you wish to make a donation to help support Room at the Inn, you can do that by sending it to Calvary and indicating that that donation is for Room at the Inn. More information will follow later regarding opportunities to volunteer or to contribute supplies. And if you have any questions, you can contact Connie Carpenter. Last but certainly not least, if you must be in the church, please remember to sign in and out at the back door or the office for contract tracing purposes. Wear a mask, maintain at least six foot social distancing, and let our sexton know where you're going to be working so that he's able to come in behind you and clean that area of the church properly. And that's all that I have for now, but on behalf of the vestry, we miss all of you, and we hope that you stay safe and healthy and have a great week. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Lynn Fry. I'm going to talk to you about the outreach ministry at Calvary Episcopal Church. Every year, the proceeds from the bazaar are distributed to benefit the immediate Columbia Boone County area. So in the last 10 years, we've been able to contribute between 100 to $150,000 to the area uh, using our proceeds uh, from the bazaar. Uh, several of those ministries include uh, basic needs for humans, uh, med medical care through MedZoo at the University of Missouri, which is a med school-led uh, clinic that's free to uh, low-income and indigent homeless uh, individuals. We've also contributed to uh, Seniors for Independent Living. We have contributed to a grandparent program where uh, 
low-income seniors are um, able to tutor in a public schools and um, increase their own income while um, helping young children uh, with their studies. Uh, we've contributed to CASA, which is child advocacy in uh, the court system, children who, who have found themselves in a situation which, which would involve the court. Um, so we've contributed to CASA. We've contributed um, to many food and um, clothing ministries. Uh, we kind of focus on basic needs. Um, so, and really I've just given you the information for the last 10 years, but this has been an ongoing ministry at, at um, Calvary really since the bizarre inception. Additionally, uh, there is the Giving Tree Ministry, which contributes to um, a more international or national uh, level crisis that perhaps the National Ch Episcopal Church is involved in. In the last two years, we've contributed about $3,000 total to um, children who are incarcerated, children who are incarcerated are being held at the border, um, separated from their family, so immigrant children. Um, we've contributed to uh, hurricane relief for um, Puerto Rico. So these are just um, a few of the um, outreach efforts that have taken place at Calvary. Um, it's really been a, a large uh, and very special part of my uh, life at Calvary is um, seeing funds go to those who are, are suffering and in need. And Calvary has a huge heart for, for outreach. And um, so I've enjoyed that ministry very much. And now we have the opportunity to listen to the sung prayer offered by Cam the Cambridge Choir Octet. The offertory anthem is called The Lord Bless You and Keep You by John Rutter. Thank you. 
let us pray in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 562, Onward Christian Soldiers. We will sing verses 1 and 3. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>